Today we're going to do something a little bit meta. Over on Twitter, Jay's Two Cents post, the dedicated Linux user's genuine question. What appeals you to Linux? For me, the very fact that I'll have to ask myself, will it work with new titles, drivers, distro disparities, etc., keeps me off. Other than screw Microsoft, what keeps you dedicated to it? Now, I know that other Linux channels have actually answered this themselves already, but I felt like giving my opinion on it as well. So throughout this video, I'm probably going to keep saying Linux, but I'm more referring to Unix-like operating systems in general. So I'm including BSD under this banner as well. So BSD people, don't at me. Now, even though macOS is a Unix-like operating system, I won't be including that because macOS in a lot of ways, even though it is Unix-like, is a lot more similar to something like Windows. So I can't speak for anyone else, but it seems like a lot of people say things like the FOSS ideology or they really care about privacy or they just don't want to pay for an operating system in general, which I can completely respect. Now, in the case of Windows 10, you don't really have to pay for it. and Microsoft doesn't actually care that much unless you're operating a business. It'll just have a little watermark in the bottom, but if you're just doing general computery things, it doesn't really matter if it's there. But as for me, I... I do think all of those things are important. Obviously, the FOSS ideology is super important. Free operating systems, yeah, that's great. Privacy, obviously, very, very important. But if I was to narrow it down, or I guess kind of expand it, if we expand it into one singular concept that keeps me on Linux, it would be freedom. So the freedom to install what I want, the freedom to customize it as much as I want. If I wanted to, I could completely live without a GUI and be perfectly fine on my system. Or if I wanted to, I could run a GUI that is so heavy that my system simply won't boot if I don't have 32 gigabytes of RAM. Now, this isn't to say that you can't go and customize Windows or Mac OS. I'm well aware that both of these operating systems, especially once you start getting into third party applications, like say rain meter there is a lot of customization that can be done but it is absolutely minuscule compared to what is available on the Linux side so for example I'm running something known as a window manager so a window manager basically does exactly what it says it manages your windows so none of these applications I installed like my terminal or my file manager or my browser or my email client none of that or even this bar up the top here none of that actually came with my system when I installed BSPWM, which is the window manager I'm running, it was a black screen that basically tiled windows like this. And that's all it did. So when I wanted to have all of these different things I wanted to do, I got to pick and choose exactly what I wanted to run. If I didn't want to have this bar up here, I didn't need to have a bar. If I didn't want to have a file manager at all and just do everything with CD and LS, I didn't even need to install a file manager. And that's what I mean by customization. I can pick and choose exactly what I want to have on my system, but this doesn't mean that only hardcore techie people can use it because there's going to be a lot of people who just want to use their computer and care about privacy or something like that and don't really want to tinker with stuff. So for those people, they can go and install something like, say, GNOME and KDE or XFCE and get a very Windows or Mac OS-like experience. And in many cases with, say, KDE, you can go and make that look like Mac OS or go and make it look like, say, Windows 7 or Windows 10 if you really want to, but you don't have to. If you just want to have whatever comes out of the box when you install the desktop environment, you're free to do so. And that's what I love about this operating system. You are free to do exactly what you want with it. And if we go back to my window manager for just a moment, when I first installed it, it actually didn't have any way to actually spawn windows. Now, this isn't the case for all window managers. If you use something like i3 or DWM, they actually do have hotkey daemons built into them. But in the case of BSPWM, basically the only windows that will be open are the windows that you spawn when you log in from the black screen. So to actually be able to spawn extra windows, I needed a separate application called SXHKD, which is similar to something like auto hotkey on windows, but is considerably easier to use. But I didn't have to use SXHKD. I could have used DXHD or any of the other hotkey daemons out there. I wasn't locked into this one application, or I could have just said, I don't want to do that and just spawn a terminal as I log in, never quit out of that terminal and then just use that terminal to spawn other windows. That was an option as well. It's kind of a terrible option, but it's an option nonetheless. Now, the nice thing about this window manager is it gives me access to an application called BSPC. Now, BSPC, the short version is basically allows me to control everything about my window manager. So the size of windows, where they're located, the order of the windows, the layout, 
basically I have complete control over how my windows are actually being laid out. So this is a tiling window manager. So that means the windows like tile as I create them. But if I wanted to have them being floating, I could still do that and have more of like a windowsy experience. I'm not a big fan of floating windows because I feel like they're just hard to keep track of, but I could do that if I wanted to. Or I could have like a layout where all my windows spawn in a stack over here, or I could have them spawn in a line or in a grid, or really whatever I wanted to do. I'm not limited to how this works out of the box. If I want to go and customize it with that application, I can go and do so. Now I want to address some of the points brought up in this tweet. So the first one is new titles. So yes, there are definitely going to be new titles that simply don't work on launch day on Linux. But for the most part, after a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, most games are probably going to be working just fine. Now there are going to be exceptions where you basically have really, really strict DRM, like in the case of the newest Doom, where it was kernel level DRM and it just completely broke on Linux. I think since then that DRM has actually been removed, but in a lot of cases it doesn't and it just never works properly on Linux. So in those cases, there's not really any way to fix it without sort of modifying the game code. And if you're gonna be doing stuff online, then obviously you might get banned from the servers. But for anything else, there are websites like ProtonDB. So ProtonDB is the main tool you're going to be using to game on Linux where the game isn't actually natively available. And on here, basically every game you could possibly want to play is going to have a post on here with people talking about whether it works, talking about fixes they did to make it work. And then you can actually see what games you can actually play. It's not like you have to play every single game that comes out. And if you do want to do that, yeah, Windows probably is going to be the better choice for you. And the other website I really recommend is Gaming on Linux. So this is a really, really good news website where basically they talk about the state of gaming on Linux, new games that are coming out, new games that have been funded, games that have been ported to Linux, things like this. And you can see what new games are actually available to play on Linux. Basically, if you don't go into games blind, you'll be fine. Now, as for the next point about drivers, so... In some cases, drivers can be a problem on Linux, but I think that some people make this out to be a bigger deal than it really is. Yes, if you go and buy like the newest cutting edge NVIDIA GPU, it's probably not going to work on launch day, especially because NVIDIA drivers are notoriously buggy on Linux. Even if you go buy like an AMD GPU, which are much better, it still probably isn't going to work launch day. But when it's something that big, people are going to be working on fixes basically the second it drops and they find out it's not working. So things like that get fixed very, very quickly. But when it comes to things like just general other hardware, like mice or keyboards or really most of the things you're going to use, it's going to be plug and play. Even things like ProSumo Audio Gear just magically works. But if there's something like, say, the Elgato Stream Deck, where you're not really sure if it is going to work on Linux, you can always just search the internet and there's going to be a forum post about it. Or there's going to be a forum post about something very similar, maybe an older model or something like that, where you can kind of work out, okay, is this actually going to work? And 99% of the time, the answer is going to be yes. I have not run into a piece of hardware except for my printer. Printers are an exception because printing on Linux is a meme and doesn't work. You basically have to buy a printer that you 100% know works on Linux, otherwise you're basically stuck. So everything besides printers magically works. Printers, I just, I just don't accept they exist anymore. And if you do need a printer, maybe a Windows VM isn't always a terrible idea. Now, I know people in the comment section are probably gonna be like, oh, but this is why your printer's not working. My printer works perfectly fine. I'm not stepping through a thousand hoops to get my printer working. I will just install a Windows VM and it will work. I'm not dealing with how terrible printing is on Linux. I've got better things to do with my time. And the last point he mentions is about distro disparities. And this sort of became super obvious that he's never actually daily drove Linux, or at least daily drove it for a reasonable amount of time, because anyone who has would realize that distro disparities aren't really that big of a deal. So the biggest disparity that exists between distros is software availability in the standard repos. So in most cases, this is only really an issue when you're exploring for new software that isn't super popular. All of the super popular tools, except for the absolute super tiny distros that have their own weird package manager, is going to have basically everything you're going to want to use. But if it's not available in the standard repos, you can always just compile it yourself. That's the nice thing about having the source code. 
if you have the source code and you have a compiler, well, you can probably compile it. And if you can't compile it because you don't have the dependencies, you can always go and compile the dependencies as well. And if you don't have access to the source code, but it's available in something like, say, Ubuntu, you can go and take the data from the Ubuntu package and install it on your distro anyway. And this is how most of the things in the AUR actually work. And for anyone who doesn't know, that is the community-driven repo available on Arch Linux. Now, when most people talk about distro disparities, what they're actually talking about is the disparities between how the distros actually look. So you might install something like Kubuntu and it will look different to Manjaro running Gnome or something like that. And that's because they're running different desktop environments. And even when they're running the same desktop environment, they might look completely different. For example, Ubuntu doesn't run a stock version of GNOME. It runs a very highly customized version of it. So if you install GNOME, it will look a bit different. But there's nothing actually stopping you from customizing your install of GNOME and making it look exactly like what's on Ubuntu. Or if you want to, say, take Manjaro running KDE and make it look like it does on, say, Plasma or something like that. There's nothing actually stopping you doing that. And even if for whatever reason you want to try out a different desktop environment, you can always just go and uninstall the one that comes out of the box on your distro and install something completely different and get a whole different experience. So say you're not a fan of Ubuntu running GNOME anymore and you want to try out KDE because you see, hey look, I can make KDE look like macOS. That's something you can go and do. So hopefully that explains my position on Linux and doesn't sound exactly the same as every single other Linux YouTuber. Now, if you want to keep running Windows, that's entirely fine. I genuinely don't care. It's your computer. Do whatever you want with it. But if you maybe thought, hey, Linux sounds kind of cool, I wouldn't recommend starting with Arch Linux like I did. There are much more friendly ways you can get into Linux, like trying out, say, Linux Mint or Ubuntu. And then from there, you can try out something where maybe you start with a blank screen and you get to build everything up from scratch. But I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. So before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Corbinian, Andrew, Nathan, Monster, Chico Bento, Joseph, Mitchell, Pity, Road, Tony, and all of the $2 patrons. If you want to go and support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available. Basically, anywhere you can listen to podcasts. And then this channel is available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute if you want to watch on a platform that isn't. YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me and I'm out.